Hey, welcome to the Brand Muse interview series. Today, I am here with Claire Yosa. We are in beautiful London, um, right outside of Westminster Abbey on Remembrance Day. So you may hear the Westminster Abbey bells peal mm -hmm. or police sirens or any number of jostling, you know, <laughs> bottles from the kitchen. Um, but we are taking this opportunity to have a conversation because I've known Claire for a few years now. Yeah. And Claire has written a book called Ditching Imposter Syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and I recently did a video on uh, imposter syndrome, which did very well. So it seemed to have hit kind of a nerve. And I know mm -hmm. that Claire is going to confirm the fact oh, that this yeah. is a very hot topic these it days. It really is. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce Claire Yosa. Thank you, Philip. So hello. And I'm the author of Ditching Imposter Syndrome. But it's also something I've specialized in for 15 years with business leaders and business owners. And this past year, I ran the 2019 Imposter Syndrome Research Study that shows if you are lying awake at 3 a.m. worrying that your clients might find you out and realize that then you're not as good as they think you are, you're not alone. Okay? So in the survey, Philip, 52% of female respondents and 49% of male respondents were struggling daily or regularly with imposter syndrome. And if you run your own business, that figure went up to 82%. Oh my gosh, really? Daily or regularly. Wow. In the past year. Wow. So you are so not alone. <laughs> wow. And so what, what, what drove you to, what was your business before this was kind okay. of launched into the focus on this topic? So since 2003, I've been doing leadership development. And then when I had my kids, I went much more into the online world because I couldn't be going around corporates. I wanted to be there for school pickup and drop off. Mm -hmm. So I worked much more with the entrepreneurs for about 10 years. And then over the last year, now that my youngest son is in full-time school, I've been pivoting back more to the corporate world and working with leader entrepreneurs rather than beginners. And this was the culmination really of 15 years of every single client showing up with the same problem, whether they were a CEO, whether they were a startup, whether they were somebody wanting to get promoted to partner, showing up with the same problem is outwardly successful and confident mm -hmm. and people looked up to them inwardly dying every night at 3 a.m. with worry and anxiety that mm -hmm. somebody would realize they were faking it. Mm -hmm. I, well, in my last corporate gig, I definitely kind of burned out yeah. to very much the description that you're talking mm. about. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure it was imposter syndrome as much as it was so kind of overwork and stress. Yeah. But so apart from waking up at three in the morning, what are some of the kind mm. of symptoms of this? So if you're running your own business, Yes, if you're an agency, you know, that freelancer, branding, a right. freelancer, one of the key things is it's procrastination. So filling up your time with stuff that doesn't actually move you forward so that you're staying really busy. It's mm. the workaholism, perfectionism, mm. okay. setting your standards unbelievably high. And then if you meet them, writing it off as fluke or luck or timing or you just had help. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, project paralysis is another one where you just put off a project. It's like playing hide and seek oh with a three year old. Like you, you like this. You know, when you play hide and seek with kids and they yeah. hide behind the curtain with their feet sticking out, yeah. you can't see me. We kind of do that with our big projects. Oh, interesting. Until the deadline, and then we pull an all nighter and use the adrenaline to get through. Right. And then the fourth warning sign is people pleasing. So you've got perfect four P's. Perfectionism, procrastination, paralysis, that's the hiding. Yeah. People pleasing is discounting without being asked, not charging what your results are worth. And it's things, when you're a freelancer or a business owner, it's not returning that call until it's just too late or not taking that opportunity for PR because you're saying, oh, it's not the right time. Or mm -hmm. Yeah, we convince ourselves that these are the right decisions to make, but actually what it is is our unconscious mind trying to keep us safe from being found out is not good enough. Interesting. And it comes right down to that identity level. It's not about mindset. It's not about the skills that you've got. It's about who am I to be doing that? So that's fascinating. <laughs> I had no idea that the, I mean, I did another video on analysis paralysis, which also really oh, hit, yeah. hit a, a chord too. And, you know, the, so analysis paralysis in terms of like, 
overthinking and then um, procrastinating. But then yeah. the interesting thing that you just mentioned was the kind of like the pulling it out, the, the all night or the pulling it out of the last yeah. second, or yeah. you're not entirely in denial that you end up screwing up in the end, yeah. but you kind of like become Superman at the very end because you yeah. know you've got to pull a rabbit out exactly. of a hat. Exactly, exactly. So we put off that project because we're scared that if we finish it, somebody's going to realize we're not as good as we're supposed oh to be. Oh my gosh, Or we yeah. don't know as much as our peers. Right. Even though our clients love our work. Right. Yeah? Yeah. So you are successful and people love your work. It's not that you're not good enough. Yeah. It's that you're scared they're going to realize you're winging it. Mm. Yeah? So uh, let me ask you a question. Mm. How does this relate to self-promotion? Because a lot of okay. um, you know the people who listen to uh, my channel and my shows, they are, you know, they're working on developing and promoting mm -hmm. their own personal brands. A lot of creative professionals and entrepreneurs are introverted or are, you know, less than, you know, they don't feel totally in the shoes of that level mm -hmm. of self-promotion or comfortable yep. with that. How does that relate to? So one of the big things is not wanting to niche. Oh, oh yeah? interesting. Yeah. Really not wanting to niche. So it doesn't matter whether you're the creative setting up your own brand or you're working for other people to set up their own brands. If you've got a client with imposter syndrome, they're going to want to serve everybody to do everything because they're wow. scared to turn anybody away. Yeah. So this is the fourth P, that's the people pleasing, is hey, I can help you with anything. Oh, okay. And we all know when you're setting up your own brand, you have to start with that total laser clarity. Right. Which problem do I solve for which person and why? Right. Yeah. And it's the resistance for that is, oh yeah, I'll do your TV stuff. Oh yeah, I'll do your print stuff. Oh yeah, I'll do your branding. Oh yeah, I'll do your website. Check oh yeah, I'll trades. do everything. Yeah. Yeah. So it's trying to please everybody because then you haven't committed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I regularly work with the UK's Institute of Directors and they have young entrepreneurs who come and have sessions, you know, like um, kind of Dragon's Den things to solve some of their problems. Mm -hmm. And a classic one there is for a designer to come in for one of those sessions and say, okay, but I work in this industry and I work in that industry and I'll work with people who are at the beginning of their journey and I'll work with people who are rebranding up here. Right. So they become known for nothing. Yeah? yeah, and this is classic imposter syndrome. So it's that side, and then on the visibility, it's being offered a golden opportunity to showcase your work, and just that flinching feeling inside makes you hold back. I think it's that's so fascinating late. because so many creative pros have a real problem with niching down because they're they're very fearful that they are going to be passing up passing up any yeah. opportunity is yeah. money that they are drawing out of their bank account and if yeah. they do everything for everybody that they are somehow going to make more money but what happens is, is that be, like you said yeah. they become known for nothing yes and one of the most important things in marketing yourself is is establishing an expectation in the audience of what they come to you for what exactly. is the problem that you solve so when they think of that problem they think oh, I'm going to go to X. And if you don't have that expectation yeah. or that have established that, um, that solution um, kind of persona for yeah. yourself, then no one will seek you out. Exactly. So I've had a great example of this myself over the last year. Great. So I've worked in general leadership development for 16 years. Yeah, and I then widened it to help entrepreneurs and you know what it's like, you get dragged into so many different pies. Yeah. And then a year ago when I knew that I was going to launch the research study and write this book, it's like, okay, I've got to knuckle down. And people by the end of the next year have got to know me for one thing. Oh, interesting, yeah. yeah. Now last night I got a deal to go and work with a business to help them on team communication. That is not my one thing, but okay. my one thing opened that door, which I can also help with. Oh, interesting. So it's yeah. not like you close the door mm -hmm. on those opportunities, but people know to come to you for one thing, and so you become the star in that one yeah. thing, and that may lead to other exactly. peripheral opportunities, which you're not going to turn your nose up at. So your one thing opens the door. Oh, for see, you to that's showcase great. showcase the rest of what you can yeah, do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've got a very dear friend who often, in England, we say, hitting you around the face with a wet kipper. Okay, which a basically is a fish, by the way, for all us. <laughs> it's, it's not one that most people want to eat. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and what it really means is somebody who's giving you a wake up call. Okay, and my friend does this really well and not very compassionately, but it works. And he'll say, Claire, how do I know who to refer to you? Mm -hmm. If I don't know that in my head in one sentence, then your branding is not clear enough. Right, right. 
Yeah. So how do you, I mean, you used to be known for a broader range of things. Yeah. This kind of segues into, you know, some conversation I usually have with guests, which is around the development of their own personal yeah. brand. So you used to be known, operational development used to be known for a whole lot of things, yeah. and now you are the go-to person yeah. for imposter syndrome. How did you niche down like that, okay. promote yourself, and establish this brand around yourself? So it was partly incredibly easy and partly the hardest thing I've ever done in my business. I okay. hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, imposter syndrome, my very first corporate mentoring client had imposter syndrome in 2003, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, okay? And it was a bit of a trend and it's lasted 16 years. So that's been my mm. thing. And something like imposter syndrome is harder to fix the mindset. So I was able to go below the surface and get results when nothing else had worked. So that was my thing. So I started by specializing in what I was great at, yeah, okay. rather than what somebody said I should specialize in. So that was the first key. Then I shifted, I pivoted from Facebook, where all the entrepreneurs hang out, to LinkedIn, okay. where the corporates and the business owners The people with out. imposter syndrome hang out. Exactly. Okay. Because on Facebook, there were loads of people that wanted to talk about imposter syndrome, but they weren't ready to take action. Oh, interesting. And how LinkedIn, did you establish that? How did you, how did you realize that? By looking at my numbers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> is I was getting great engagement on Facebook, but no conversions. See, that's interesting. I had the same experience on Twitter when okay. I was promoting my videos for the first year. I was, you know, cross-purposing and promoting my videos on yeah. on Twitter. I was getting a lot of likes. I was getting yeah. a lot of like shares. But when it came down to it, when I looked at my analytics, no one was clicking on the link to yeah. go to the video. Yeah. And I, you know, I put my back into Twitter for a year until yeah. I realized that. I was really not getting any traction. I was getting a lot of echoes, but yeah, I wasn't getting any traction. Exactly. They were browsers and I action turned tables. my back on Twitter and cut yes. off this huge amount of workload <laughs> and it and my channel suffered none from it. You so, know? I'm getting almost all of my paid speaking gigs via Twitter DMs. Wow, okay. Which is fascinating. So, 95% yeah. of my effort is going to LinkedIn. So, the bit that was but easy, the communication is coming to you through Twitter. Exactly. So, I'm just resharing on Twitter. I'm not doing okay. anything fresh on Twitter. All right. And what's happening is they're seeing my bio, they're seeing the fact I'm putting out credible stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll be edgy and sometimes I'll put out personal stuff. But they go through and the look. And the key thing I've done on Twitter is I'm resharing my PR. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when they look at my Twitter feed, it's credibility see, sharing. It's credibility. So it's like, oh, she did this interview, she did that article in the Independent, you know, she's just had this review. Mm -hmm. And it's not bragging, it's simply here is stuff that's adding value, but it hasn't come from my own website. Yeah. Well, and you're also showing that there is buzz around what you're doing, and all media channels want to jump on the buzz bandwagon, exactly. right? Because if they know a topic is hot and it's getting viewership and other people are doing it, they have to be competitive, so they want exactly. to talk to you too. Exactly. So the easy bit was picking a topic on LinkedIn. The right. really hard bit was spending a year talking about pretty much nothing else. Because yeah. I love variety. Well, now you've yeah. written a book, and now the book is really, really successful. Yeah. So you're going to be talking nothing about it for the next year or two, right? Five. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing, is because my book includes my five-step process to actually ditch imposter yeah. syndrome, I can write about any of those steps now. So oh, that's what true. I, so what I've done, because every post I've done on LinkedIn for a year, pretty much every post has had imposter syndrome as a tag. What happens now is whoever on LinkedIn talks about imposter syndrome, I get tagged in the comments by somebody. Right. And I've actually got people saying, Claire, how did you become the number one person on LinkedIn for imposter syndrome? Because there are a lot of other coaches out there that want that badge. I bet. Yeah. I bet there are. That was never my intention. My intention was simply to force myself to focus where I was putting my energies. Because LinkedIn is a mirror to what I'm doing when I'm not on LinkedIn. Right. Yeah, I could have scattered my energies so I could have said I'll set up this course and that course and I'll do that masterclass. By forcing myself to be focused on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I forced myself to be focused at my desk. So when you say at my desk, does that mean on the book? On the research, okay. on the book, on every conversation I had of basically allowing myself to own that one expertise right. that then gets me in for other stuff. So I've got leadership development work set up for next year that has imposter syndrome in it, mm -hmm. but it's mostly about leading from your heart in a head-based world, which is what my passion is. Okay. Yeah. So it was that laser focus. And so often I wanted to go off on tangents and I had my mastermind around me with that wet kipper saying, no, Claire. <laughs> 
This is very important. You should listen to this because this is all about focusing and centering your efforts around one particular goal because number one, you become known for it. But then also number two, and this is something I talk about a lot, is that when people go off and start building their personal brands, they want to be everywhere. Uh They want to be everywhere and do everything all the time. And the problem is, is that it's so much better to show up deep and and Mm. concertedly in one or two Mm. channels and not even be on the others than yeah. it is to show up badly on 15. Absolutely. And because people say, oh, I have to have my face on Instagram. I have to have my face on you know, Twitter and the podcast. And, you know, yeah. and then they spread themselves so thin that they don't get the depth or the exposure that they could if they really focused on one. So that's really exactly. interesting. Exactly. And it's also spreading yourself in a way that's appropriate to that channel. Right. So I've actually shifted how I show up on LinkedIn. I've rebranded on, oh, sorry, on um, Instagram. Okay. I've rebranded on Instagram. So all of my business stuff now goes through Twitter and LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Instagram is Claire the novelist because I also write novels. It's one of my hobbies. Oh, really? Okay. So- <laughs> this is another point. Another video on being a multi-creative. So you yeah. are also a multi-creative. So a lot yeah. of people have you know, a primary business yeah. focus creative thing, but then you exactly. also have something on the outside, which is much more free. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I mean, I, I spent 30 years wanting to be a novelist and I had a throwaway comment from an English teacher that an essay I'd written, I thought was amazing, was contrived <laughs> and I only got a B. So I wasn't much of a perfectionist. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so and it this, stuck with you forever. It, it, it did. It did. For 30 years, I never made up a story because I told myself the mantra of I can't write stories. Wow. I published six non-fiction books, I've actually done five non-fiction books, and then this story was just wanting to come out, and so I did my work, I cleared that limiting belief, because I knew what the block was, which always helps, so I just did the process Mm. I do, and I was gutted, because I felt no different, and four days later, I had drafted seven novels. What? And four months later, one of them was in the shops, including going through the editing process and the print run. Wow, so, so this when is you clear traditional out, publishing. Traditional publishing, going through a print run, going into wow, shops. that's amazing. And the book was basically written in a month. That's incredible. Because I cleared out that really deep unconscious block and the, suddenly but it But were you focusing like 100% just on writing that book? Uh, there was summer holidays, okay? okay. And All so right. I was up when the sun rose and I would write 5,000 words before the kids were out of bed and it was the happiest summer I've ever had. Wow, where were you? At home. Okay. Sat in my in the kitchen UK? with the dogs in the UK, on my sofa in the kitchen. Wow. <laughs> See, being able to express your creativity in ways that make your heart sing. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really blessed. The first two books are out in the series. The third one in the trilogy comes out next year, and they've been described as unput down. So wait, what are they called? Okay. Um, so. The series is called The Danucci Deception, so it's okay. a bit of Mafia, a bit of Me Too. All right. A right ripping yarn, but it won't give you nightmares. I don't do blood and gore. Okay. <laughs> a ripping yarn. A right ripping yarn. I love very, that. very English. Um, so the first book is called You Take Yourself With You. The second one is called First Tell No Lies. Okay. And the third one is called Your Voices in My Head. These are so airport ready titles. They really are. They really are. There's more substance to yeah. them than that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to circle back to imposter yeah. syndrome, do. though. Because I know that because so many creative pros suffer from it and freelancers mm-hmm. and, and also, I've, you know, I've been working with some very C-suite level entrepreneurs yeah. this year, some of which I was very shocked mm. to learn have had this for years, yeah. incredibly accomplished people. Yeah. Um, but so what are some of the techniques that we were talking about this at, at, at yeah. you know, over drinks the other night? What are some of the techniques that people can use yeah. to kind of like directly, um, face imposter syndrome in their lives? So the absolute first thing is to realize you are not alone. Okay. Okay. This is what keeps most people trapped is it's actually shame. Oh, really? Is I, you know, everybody thinks I'm successful and I'm not, and I don't deserve to be so here. So it's denial. It's denial and shame. And okay. because we feel ashamed of realizing that we've faked it and mm-hmm. we've pulled the wall over everybody's eyes, which you haven't. Okay. Yeah. They know you're great <laughs> because we think we have, we hide it and we push it down. Right. Now what the research study found is that with guys, they're more likely to push it down, mm-hmm. which triggers anxiety and depression, and they were five times more likely than women to turn to alcohol and meditation, medication to cope, okay? okay? Women, once they realize that, okay, everybody else is feeling like this, yeah, look around the office, look around your commuter train, and half the people there 
had these thoughts at some point at 3 a.m. in the last year, women are more likely to talk to each other and have that opening up of a conversation, right. removing the taboo. It's a pressure release valve. Exactly. Then you can start doing things. You, so in my process, the first step is to realize that there is life beyond imposter syndrome. Mm. But you have to be able to imagine it because your mind will not let you make a change it believes is impossible or dangerous. Okay. Yeah. So recognizing it, number one. Are yeah. there any kind of like concrete steps in thought process that people can practice? Absolutely. Is starting to visualize how will I be living my life when imposter syndrome is no longer a thing. So it's mental rehearsal for the life you want because what you're mm. actually doing is rewiring your neurology to not to need imposter syndrome mm. because it's just hardwired in your brain. It's an autopilot yeah. in your neural pathways. So that conscious visualization of, okay, this client pitch, where I normally have an imposter syndrome trigger, I want to just spend a few moments mentally rehearsing how will that feel? That's the key, it's mm. the emotion. How different will I feel about that situation when I no longer have imposter syndrome? Because this opens up the possibility, yeah? The second step is learning to tame that inner critic, that voice in your head. That's a hard one. Very easy. Really? Really easy. How? You just need to know how. Okay. Okay, emergency quick fix. Three-step process, okay? A, B, C. So we can all remember A, B, C, even if we're stressed. Accept, breathe, choose. So your inner critic says, oh, what if they realize you're not good enough and that your concepts are not going to be as good as such and such a competitor? Don't fight that thought. The backfire effect means it will dig its heels in and justify itself, okay? okay. Accept. That was an imposter syndrome thought. So that's fired off all of the biochemical reactions, yeah. your stress response, right. the fight, flight, freeze, yeah. the blood flow goes from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala that only cares about survival from that saber-toothed tiger, you can't think straight. So you need to reset, and that's the B for breathe. So breathing in through the nose, just doing that three times, and then some belly breathing about here, okay. resets your nervous system and clears the stress hormones. So that's the B. The C, I love this one, choose. Consciously, consciously choose to think one thought about yourself that is positive hmm. and make it really specific, okay? Because if it's specific, your unconscious mind can't object. If you go, I am the most creative place person on the planet, your mind's Debatable. gonna go, no. Right? If you say, the client feedback on my last project was such and such, and they said that was because I am whatever, right. it can't deny that because it's there, it's in writing, or you were at the meeting. So accept, breathe, choose. What you're doing, okay, in the, in the UK we drive cars with gear sticks, so I think you call them stick shifts? Yes. Yeah. So if you try to go from first gear to second gear without going through neutral, I used to be an engineer, <laughs> you will destroy your gearbox yes. and your car will not go very far ever again. You have to go through neutral to change gear. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people take negative thinking and they plaster positive affirmations over the top and they wonder why it doesn't work. Okay. okay. That's like trying to go from first gear to sixth gear without going through neutral. Okay. Okay. So your gearbox literally destroys itself, this inner conflict. So what you're doing with ABC, except the B goes through neutral, neutral and choose takes you to another gear. So you are actually creating new neural pathways in your brain to go from inner critic thought to cheerleader thought in a way that's healthy without whitewashing. And if you want a ninja tip, yeah, okay, absolutely. Ninja tip, your your C, have an emotion that goes with that. Okay, when you tie in an emotion to a thought, it creates the neural pathway at a much deeper, faster level. So if you go from beating yourself up, breathing into neutral to reset the nervous system, and then choose a thought when your heart just went, that was really great, and you feel that emotion you are reprogramming the filters in your brain the neural pathways in your brain so you are clearing the old autopilots it's called neuroplasticity I, yeah, yeah i know that term there you go okay. so this is how but people new. throw it around the abc is one way how to do neuroplasticity awesome and we can all remember accept breathe choose yeah that's great then you can work on the deeper stuff yeah the next layer is the limiting beliefs and the fears let's clear those out then you that's get... another interview i'll have claire back we can talk about those yeah and then step four is where we actually clear out imposter syndrome okay that's where you take off the masks the shutdown the coping mechanisms because you don't need them anymore but they keep mm. you stuck 
And you do it in a way that allows you to show up with all of who you are. So it's like you're taking all of the shades off that light, that Marianne Williamson quote, yeah? yeah. And you allow yourself to shine and you feel genuinely grounded, mm. confident and resilient. No more fake it till you make it. Yeah. And the step five, which is where I love people to end up, is becoming the leader you were born to be. Because when we're running a business, we're there to lead at some level. Yeah, yeah? even lead your clients if that's what Exactly. That is. So right. you take all of that and then you consciously choose, who do I want to become in the next 5, 10, 50 years? And you start taking actions towards focusing on that instead of focusing on the fear. Right. Yeah? And triage, constant triage. Exactly. So you have set yourself free to express that that is innately genius within you. Yeah. Tiny steps. Yeah, so I call with my clients. I get them to celebrate their micro wins every day. Mm. Yeah, it's three things every day that you think, I nailed that. Doesn't matter how small it is. I brush my teeth. Yeah, yeah. some days. Well, that's good. <laughs> three micro wins every day. It teaches you how to spot what you're doing well. Okay, not just what goes wrong and it means you're not waiting until the real biggies to celebrate right so giving yourself that positive feedback every single day becomes your new normal mm -hmm. and that shifts your biochemistry it shifts how your cells react to emotions and it starts to make that inner critic become your cheerleader mm. without going to war with it i love that so do you discuss all of these steps in the step book step by step <laughs> I mean, it would be a really cruel book Ditching if it didn't give you the how. <laughs> and where is this available? Okay, so if you're watching us in the USA, you can get it through Amazon. If you're in Europe, you can get it through Amazon or order it through your local bookstores. It's available as a beautiful hardback, straight back cover. Ooh. <laughs> For all of you prints, you know, kind of aficionados out here, there is a, a spot varnish on here, which is very sexy. Oh, matte to spot matte varnish. Laminate. It's really oh. nice. And so, and I'll, I'll have links to this in the description of the podcast and the video, so you can get to this very easily. Yeah. Okay, so one last question yeah. I always ask my guests. Claire, do you have, and I didn't warn you, but usually <laughs> I warn my guests that I'm going to ask this question because it's a pretty heavy question. Yeah. Do you have a personal mantra that you try to live your life by? Oh, how many? So I'm a yoga and meditation teacher One, as one well. personal mantra. Okay. So I said my mantra before I left my hotel room this morning. Okay. Okay. And it was the last thing I said as I closed the hotel room door, knowing I was coming to this interview and this day of the event today here at Upinor Summit. And it was, let me be there for those who need me. I love that. Mm. Be of service. Yeah. Yeah. That is great. Thank you all so much for listening and watching. And thank, thank you, Claire, you. for taking the time out of this very busy schedule today. It's been a joy um, to talk with to you, talk. Philip. Thank you. And good luck with your book. It's, you. I, I can't wait to read it. <laughs>